Yo, yo, yicky yak, yicky yak, yicky yak. Yo, yo, yicky yak. Oh, did you guys catch me doing my little victory dance? Because I just put my uniform on. Yeah, the Libra code. Did you guys see my video about the Libra code? We can put on our uniform. Hey, if you are the what? Are you like some type of an official, government official or something? Or wait, are we in war? I guess you can put on the coat, the, um, what is it called? The uniform. You could put the uniform on, right? <laughs> Watch the Libra code. I'm pretty sure I did one of my first videos is the Libra code, but I wanted to show you. Uh, today I'm gonna go, we'll see if I can make an offer. Hey, I'm gonna make an offer on a house. Um. Might as well go over where the judges live because here comes the judge right here. I want to share this screen with you and show you something. <laughs> All right, so we, we're going to have to look at publication 1212-26 USC sections 1271 and 1275. There's that dinging noise again. Ah, I can't handle it. Everybody's waking up. People are notifying each other. Okay, so uh, the other thing that we need to look at is chapter 33A of American Jurisprudence. 2D, pages 695 and 715. It is intended to identify the living man, woman, as the sponsor of the credit when the U.S. Inc. failed to redeem the Federal Reserve notes, which signified the U.S. Inc.'s debt to the people, you know, the national debt. The 1099A identifies the value of the original mortgage note as the amount of the credit that has been sponsored by you and me, the people, the true creditors. Okay, time for my iPad. To go into my room. Oops, I guess I just threw it on the dog. Whoops. <laughs> Sorry, Karma, didn't know you were on my bed. Thought you were outside. I guess not. Anyways, so I bought this cute little necklace for Karma so she could be all gangsta like, you know, yo, yo, yicky yak, yicky yak, yicky yak. But since she can't go with me, to the four houses, I'm ho hopefully only going to go to one and make an offer. With all my stuff, I got my template here. So I made a copy. Okay, I made a couple of copies uh, of the 2021. And... Um, let me see. Let me stop share for a second. Not that I want to show any information or anything like that, because I don't. But so I made a copy of the 1099A on a piece of paper, just as a template to put in the packet for the real estate lady. Let's even see if we can get this far, because she might be going, oh, no, this is no. I don't know what you're doing. That's why I typed out this other thing. And I'm going to have to make some type of a instruction for her. I don't want to show her face. I don't even want to show the property because I don't, oh no. Am I showing it? Stop. Don't mean to do that. I meant to share. Um... Oh, this, this is what I meant to share. Die. All right. So I was reading this. It says that the 1099A, that's this thing, the coveted acquisition abandonment secured property. Okay, this is what, listen, the 1099A identifies the value of the original mortgage note as the amount of the credit when we get our credit, right? <clears throat> that has been sponsored by you and me, the people, the true creditors, who had not claimed it 
because of lack of knowledge, did we know that we're supposed to do that in the courts or when we got our house? No, we did not know that. So we had lack of knowledge. But the banks and the courts make claims to the credit as the borrower of the funds. Using the social security name, uh, social security number and the name of the person in using the 1099A as abandonment of property acquisition, unbeknownst to us, right? Did we know that we're supposed to be doing that? No, we didn't know. So it is subversion, like a submarine. You're going underneath, you're going in the back end, you know? And that's kind of how they do their stuff. You know, they even change the, the definition of marriage when those nine Supreme Court justices in the summer of 2015 in July, I remember it well because I was in a political science class at that time. And they went through the back end to redefine what marriage is. And now people think that they can marry the same sex. That is not the original intent, as you all know, because you need a man and a woman to make children, okay? Anything else is lust. It is. It's lust, all right? It's deviation from the truth. So they went through the back door or the back end, if you will, pun intended, to redefine marriage between one man and one woman. Because if you look in Title 26, which is the IRS code, they didn't change that about marriage. If you look in the definition section 7701, you'll see that it says a man and a woman. Let's go check it. Well, let's see. How do I figure this out? I guess I'm going to have to go. Oh, I don't want to get rid of that. Okay. Mm. Okay. I'm still looking at the houses and I don't really want to get rid of that email, but maybe I should just for the safety sakes. Yeah, I'll do that. All right. New tab. What were we looking up? Title 26. That's IRS code, right? Definitions. 7701. Thank you, Freedom Law School. I got that planted in my brain. Yeah, I do. All right. So let's go there. Let me share this with you. All right. Sheesh, so many things that you have to do. It's ridiculous. Come on. Hey, here we go. 26. This is the definition portion. Yeah, here's person. The term person shall be construed to mean and include an individual, a trust, estate, partnership, association, company, or corporation. Partnership and partner. The term partnership includes a syndicate. Huh? How? Huh? What? What? Group? Oh, whoa. Pool? Whoa. Joint venture? Oh, this is how they've been doing it right here. Or other unincorporated organization, because you're not incorporated, are you? No, you're unincorporated. <laughs> organization? Through or by means of which any business, financial operation, or venture is carried on, and which is not within the meaning of this title. Okay. Where are we? A trust or a state or a corporation and the term partner includes a member in such a syndicate, syndicate, group, pool, joint venture or organization, you know, like a timeshare or, hey, how about you? You're the partner. You know, you're that liability partner. Okay, so we're going to keep going because I want to show you something. You can look up all these under 26 U.S. Code 7701. Corporation, 
includes associations, joint stock companies, and insurance companies domestic. Oh, when applied to a corporation or partnership means created and organized in the United States or under the law of the United States or any state regulations. And there's foreign, there's, hey, fiduciary. The, fidu the term fiduciary means a guardian. Oh, trustee, executor, administrator, receiver, conservator, or any person acting in any fiduciary capacity for any person. That's what we're going to have do today. Right, real estate lady? Okay. We want to keep going. Scroll all the way down. Keep going, commissioner, taxpayer. Look at all these great definitions. Withholding agent. Oh, husband and wife. Wait a second right here. Husband and wife. Doesn't it say husband and husband or wife and wife? Or husband and husband and wife? or wife and wife and wife and husband. No, as used in section 2516, if the husband and wife therein referred to are divorced, wherever appropriate to the meaning of such section, the term wife shall read former wife. I like that. And the term husband shall read former husband. Oh, that sounds better than X, right? This is my former husband. rather than this is my ex. Okay, well look, and if the payments described in such section are made by or on behalf of the wife or former wife to the husband or former husband instead of vice versa, wherever appropriate to the meaning of such section, the term husband shall be read wife. Huh? The term husband shall be read wife. What? And the term wife shall be read husband. That's weird. That reminds me of in the last days, they shall say that good is evil and that evil is good. What they do, this like switchy rooey thing. But anyways, right there, they didn't change it, husband and wife. They didn't change it to husband and husband or wife and wife. So I'm just saying. Okay, so you can look these things up. This, this is good definitions right here because this comes from the IRS. And if the IRS is attached to the banks and to the courts, wouldn't you want to know what the, hey, there's employee down there. Whoa. Let me just read that for a second. <clears throat> for the purpose of applying the provisions of section 79, we got, we got to look that up. With respect to group term life insurance, Purchased for employees? What? Yeah. Uh-huh. I believe I've heard that the DMV on the license has insurance. Hey, because you're an employee of the state, what can I say? They're so nice. They just didn't tell you. And if you want to, like, you know, get rid of your eyeballs or something, if something happens to you, you can put on there. That you're going to donate your body parts but you know in case you get in an accident and they take your eyeballs out and then you live then you won't have any eyeballs so i don't suggest that you donate any of your body parts whatsoever and don't be putting it on that thing and well just turn that thing in anyways because you're not really an employee did you get paid no you didn't get paid so fire yourself i'm just saying but i'm not really saying what to do i'm just saying what i did for the purpose of applying the provisions of section 104, 105, 106 with respect to accident and health insurance, what? or accident and health plans, what? Did you know that State Farm is settling with me? Some man in a truck went across my path when I was going straight home. And I got a head-on collision November 14th of 20. 21 which is last year yeah and it's now march of 2022 <sighs> they just called me yesterday they want to settle so they did give me some money up front to get a car but you know the what do they call um pain and suffering portion they weren't going to give it to me you know why because they said that in california 
according to Prop 213, a victim of, a, of an accident must show proof of car insurance. So I sent them a little text or emailed them to say, can you show me the law that says that I, the living woman, in my private conveyance using my home goods, needs to have insurance for my car? Then I did take a picture of a 1099A, and I did sign the back, you know, the picture. I take a picture and send it to them. But then I did show them the secured party creditor paperwork because they did ask me, are you financially uh, responsible? I said, yeah, here's a hundred million on my bond that I'm leaning. Here's a picture of it. Well, okay, so it's been a long time. And guess what? Those people are not handling my deal. They gave me over to a new person. Yeah, so the new person just called me. And the other lady was saying that um, she was sick for a whole month and couldn't get back to me. I'm like, right. Yeah. Did she get like, I don't know, some revelation? Because there is no law that says that we need to have insurance to travel in our private conveyance in our home goods? Or what, what happened? They wouldn't tell me, of course. Anyways, so now they wanted me to know how much. And I'm thinking, well, let's see, Jacoby and Myers, they probably would do ah, 80,000 or well, Larry H. Parker, 50,000 or something like that. But um, I'm going the cheapy route. I'm like, uh, I guess I just need like enough to compensate me for the stupid car that I bought from my reprobate neighbor and double it yeah so they're going to give me an offer well of course their offer is going to be low so i'm going to have to write them back and say mm, too low let's go a little higher oh and by the way i'm grinding my teeth because of all this stress here's my dental bill for filling my teeth um what else there's more but anyways i digress just saying yeah that driver's license that has insurance on it how is it that otherwise i mean i gave mine up right so there's some money in that thing they can use that for the accident insurance and all that jazz i don't really know why they approved it other than they they couldn't find the law but anyways levy Okay, without levy. Okay, so taxable year, fiscal year, trader business, tax court, uh, internal revenue code. Interesting how there's a court. And they talk about United States, United States persons. Oh, bank, look at it, it's all here. They're all in bed together. We got the courts, the banks. Oh, now we even have the utility. What is this regulated public utility? That means a corporation engaged in furnishing or the sale of electric energy, gas, water, or sewage. That just sent, I just sounded like Eon for a second. <laughs> or sewage disposal services or transportation, not included in subparagraph. In an interstate suburban municipal, or, oh wow. So all of this stuff. What is this? What is this? What is this transportation not included in clause II by motor vehicle? What? What? Transportation? Interstate suburban municipal electric railroad. Municipal, suburban, trackless trolley system on a municipal or suburban bus system. And then they say here, not included by motor vehicle in that. If the rates for such furnishing or sale, as the case may be, have been established or approved by a state, a political subdivision thereof, by an agency or instrumentality of the United States, 
by a public service or public utility instrumentality of the United States, wait, commission, excuse me, or other similar body of the District of Columbia or of any state, which is District of Columbia, or political subdivision thereof, or by a foreign country, or an agency instrumentality, or political subdivision thereof. Kind of interesting here. A corporation be engaged as a common carrier in the furnishing or sale of transportation of gas by pipeline, if subject to the jurisdiction of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And it just goes on and on to tell you all these corporations. Wow. This is good stuff right here. You should read it. Oh, wow. Oh, look at that. A common parent corporation. Hmm. Interesting. You know how like the county is the umbrella for those courts that are franchises like Chuck E. Cheese's. You know, in California, for as many districts that they have, each of them has their own franchise. Not of a Chuck E. Cheese, but of a court. <laughs> the, the Judicial Council of California. I think there's 54 of them. Kind of interesting, hmm? Look at how it says regulated public utility. <clears throat> See that? Regulated public utility. Regulated public utility. Interesting. It's regulated public utility. All right. If the taxpayer establishes to the satisfaction of the secretary that its revenue from regulated rates described in subparagraph A and or D and its revenue derived from unregulated rates are derived from the operation of a single interconnected coordinated system or from operation of more than one such system, the unregulated rates have been and are substantially as favorable to users and consumers as are the regulated rates then such revenue from such unregulated rates shall be considered for purposes of proceeding of the preceding sentence up there as income derived from sources described in subparagraph A or D. Oh, got some public law right there repealed. This might be something to look into. The term enrolled actuary. Oh, what is that? Means a person. Excuse me. Who? Oh, what happened? Oh, there it is. Enrolled actuary. The term enrolled actuary means a person who is enrolled by the joint board. Oh, remember we looked at the definition of board before? I think it meant banks. For the enrollment of actuaries established under sub subtitle C of the Title III of the Employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974. How do we get back? This is interesting. The term tax return preparer means any person who prepares for compensation. Oh, yeah, for compensation, or who employs one or more persons to prepare for compensation. Any return of tax imposed by this title or any claim for refund of tax imposed by this title, 26, for purposes of the preceding sentence, the preparation of a substantial portion of a return or claim for refund shall be treated as if it were the preparation of such return or claim for refund. Oh. Why don't they just say the term tax return preparer is a person that you pay for 
to do your taxes instead of all this mumbo jumbo and have to go back to the purposes of the preceding sentence. The preparation of a substantial portion of a return or claim for refund shall be treated as if it were the preparation of such a return. What the, what the heck is all that? That's weird. Or claim for refund. Shall be treated as if it were the preparation. Every time I say preparation, I think of preparation H, but not, not that I've tried that because I haven't. I hear that the beauty people, they put it here under your eyes if you have puffiness instead of down there. Exceptions. A person shall not be a tax return preparer merely because such person furnishes typing, reproducing, or other mechanical assistance, or prepares a return or claim for refund of the employer or of an officer of employer prepares as a fiduciary a return or claim for refund for any person or prepares a claim for refund for a taxpayer in response to any notice. Yeah. Okay. Joint return. Hey, wait, what's up? A husband and a wife, see? Just saying. If those nine Supreme Court justices changed the definition of marriage for anybody that you want to marry, husband, husband, wife, wife, then why didn't they change this? Title 26, it still says husband and wife. That would be one man and one woman, just saying. Hey, look at, for those Indian tribal government peoples down here, just keep reading and, you know, just saying, here's all these special rules for Alaska natives. Wow. The term tin means the identifying number of assigned to a person under section 6109. Oh, like the tin man, right? Yeah. Interesting. Really good stuff. Well, go there to title 26 definition 7701 and look up all these great definitions but um i really want to keep reading this but um i think that we should probably get into that other one where did i see that oh public was it 1212 let me look it up again oh publication 1212 yeah, that's the one I want to look up. Okay, I guess I can, I guess I can just start again. Wait, move out of the way, this thing. Yeah, I got to get to my deal. Okay, so let me look up publication. Ah, what's the deal? Publication. Total. I kind of want to read this. I need to know it because you know what? I'm getting ready to go and look at a beautiful house and the main thing is uh, I gotta have to get agreement from the fiduciary the real estate lady she's I gotta make sure oh hey what it is a oh, whole this is the guide to the original issue discount you're kidding me oh Publication 1212, this, let's look, look at this one. This publication has two purposes. Its primary purpose is to help brokers and other middlemen identify publicly offered original issue discount. This is probably why we do the OID, but I have a feeling that we need the two 8281s right here. I think we need this. Well, let's see. Publication 1212, Guide to Original Issue Discount, OID Instruments. All right. Tells you all about it. Oh, gosh. <sighs> got to get past, got to grow up. You got to grow up. You can't be a Toys R Us kid anymore. I think Toys R Us is gone, right? <clears throat> so you got to grow up now. Hmm, you're going to have to start reading. Okay, we don't need to look at photographs of missing children, although I'm sure it's probably a good thing. Remick, 
CDO information reporting requirements, brokers and other middlemen must follow special information reporting requirements for real estate mortgage investment conduit. Oh, this is what we're talking about. And collateralized debt obligation interest. The rules are explained in publication 938. Well, they would have to go and do that. I hate it when they do that. Holders of interest in Remix. That's the real estate mortgage investment conduit. And the collateralized debt obligation should see chapter one of publication 550 for information on Remix and CDOs. All right, wait, let's go over here. Right here. I just finished reading this. I'll read it again. This publication has two purposes. Its primary purpose is to help brokers and other middlemen identify public offered original issue discount, OID, debt instruments, debt instruments. They may hold as nominees for the true owners. Um, so they can file forms 1099 OID or forms 1099 interest as required. The other purpose of the publication is to help owners of publicly offered OID debt instruments determine how much OID to report on their income tax returns. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna say zero, right? I remember seeing a picture of how they filled out that OID and darn it, I don't have a 2021, I only have a 2019. I need one sent to me or maybe, you know, the real estate person can get get it original issue discount tables the tables of publicly offered oid instruments okay i guess those are the tables that's where you go boom by clicking the link under recent developments <clears throat> an advanced release of the annual tables is posted in the fall of each year that would be september august all that stuff followed by the final release later the same year or early in the subsequent year, next year in January. The information in the OID tables comes from the issuers of the debt instruments and from financial publications and is updated annually. So there's the debt instruments not in the OID tables later. Brokers and other middlemen can rely on the OID tables to determine for information reporting purposes whether a debt instrument was issued at a discount and the OID to be reported on information returns. However, because the information in the OID tables has generally not been verified by the IRS as correct, oh, the following tax matters are subject to change upon examination by the IRS. The OID reported by owners of a debt instrument on their income tax returns. I wasn't planning on filing any tax returns. I don't know. Am I supposed to? The issuer's classification of an instrument as debt for federal income tax purposes. The issuer's classification of an instrument. Oh, that's right there. Yeah. This paper, these things are instruments of debt. What do we have here? 1096. Does it say anything about 8281s in here? No, but it does say 1099 OID. So if you have a 1099 OID, you got to have a 1096 and you check one box only. Now, if you have a 1099 OID, you're supposed to have two 8281s. Did you know that? Well, I don't really know what you're supposed to do with them yet. I don't know. I'm just a beneficiary. I don't know. Okay, so let me see what else what we got here. But I'm just saying, 
these things um, are instrument, the issuer's classification of an instrument as debt for federal income tax purposes. That's debt, right? So if the United States is in charge or Congress is in charge of paying all the debt, then boom, pay it. Get me my house. <clears throat> the adjusted basis of a debt instrument. I don't know. Instructions for issuers of OID debt instruments. In general, issuers of publicly offered OID debt instruments must file, for here it is right here, must file form 8281. Where is it? Within 30 days after the date of issuance, and if registered with Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, uh, within 30 days after registration with the SEC. I that part I don't know. Securities and Exchange Commission. Well, if these are securities, and we're doing an exchange today to buy a house with this money right here, then um, I think somebody's going to have to register with the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. It says within 30 days after registration with the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, a separate form. 8281 must, must be filed for each issuance. Or SEC registration. For more information, see form 8281 and its instructions. Yeah, it says it right here. It says right here. Let me just. Hang on a second. Come on, baby. Where are we? Get the bubble. How do I? Oh, the stop share. Okay. Hang on a second. You got to look at this. It says right here, down here on the bottom. Signature within 30 days after the date of issuance of an OID debt instrument. That would be that 1099 OID. Or if registered with the SEC or, or if registered with the SEC after the date of issuance. Hmm. I like that word or. So right here, within 30 days after the date of issuance of an OID debt instrument, you know, where is that thing? Uh, you know, the OID one, 1099 OID, don't have it up here. Right here, this is what you got to know. Within 30 days after the date of the OID debt instrument is registered. Wait, stop. Let me just read it again. You're going to put your signature down here. Not who, not me. Me? I don't know. We're going to see who this kind of tail. I don't know. Signature within 30 days after the date of issuance of an OID debt instrument, which is that 1099 OID, or, or if registered with the SEC after the date of issuance, within 30 days after the date the OID debt instrument is registered with the SEC, send two copies. Two, two copies of this, not one, two copies of Form 8281 and any attachments to Department of the Treasury, Internal Revenue Service, Ogden, Utah. Now, I know that Chris Hauser's deal isn't doing this. He's just doing the 1099 OID and he's sending it to the Constitution Avenue. 
One, 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 one. Hmm. Hmm. But he's not doing the 8281s. I don't know. The instructions there say to send it to Ogden. Send those to Ogden. I don't know. I guess I could just, I have these. I think my real estate person would be overwhelmed. I don't know how to do that. He <laughs> he. We're gonna have to find out what's the deal with this. Um, I don't know. Has anybody gotten a house yet? Did you just do the ten ninety nine OID, and you didn't do the two copies of that? Send them to Ogden, Utah. Let me know. Well, I guess I'll keep you posted and see what up. But anyways, I have an appointment at 10 o'clock and it's 8.20 right now. So I got to eat some food. Um, let me just look. Hang on. I think I was supposed to keep reading. I'm getting hungry. Okay, what is this? This is the OID thing? Hmm. This is the publication 12.12, right? Yeah. All right, I should probably know about this. Let me just keep reading. Debt instrument, the term debt instrument means any instrument or contractual contractual arrangement. That's what we're doing today. That constitutes indebtedness. I am indebted. Oh, about $2 million for this house under general principles of federal income tax law, including, for example, a bond, debenture note it's a note certificate or other evidence of indebtedness yeah it is i'm gonna buy the judge's house because i'm the judge here comes the judge boom it generally does not include an annuity contract issue price for debt instruments listed in section ia and section ib of the final release of original issued discount OID tables, the issue price is generally the initial offering price to the public. Excluding bond houses and brokers. <clears throat> what does that mean? At which a substantial amount of these instruments was sold. Oh, interesting. Market discount. An OID debt instrument generally has market discount. If your adjusted basis in the debt instrument, here's where I'm at, immediately after you acquired it, usually it's purchase price. There you go. Put the price of the house, 2 million bucks right there, was less than the debt instrument's issue price. Okay, wait, let me read this again. The OID debt instrument generally has market discount if your adjusted basis in the debt instrument immediately after you acquired it. Usually its purchase price was less than the debt instrument's issue price. What does that mean? plus the total OID that accrued before you acquired it. In general, a debt instrument is purchased in the secondary market at a market discount. What? When the value of the debt instrument has decreased since the instrument's issue date, for example, because of an increase in interest rates. Yeah. An OID debt instrument has market discount. <clears throat> if your adjusted basis in the debt instrument immediately after you acquired it, usually its purchase price was less than the debt instrument's issue price. What does this mean? 
If you're OID dead instrument, this thing has market discount. If your adjusted basis in the debt instrument immediately after you acquired it, usually its purchase price was less, yeah, than the debt instrument's issue price, yeah. Like you can say, I want to, I want to buy that 18, was it 1,800,000 something house for 2 million. So if this was 2 million and it says, you know, because you're going to offer 2 million instead of, you know, 1,8, an OID debt instrument has market discount. This says market discount. If your adjusted basis in the debt instrument immediately after you acquired it, usually it's purchase price. Yeah, if the purchase price was less than the debt instrument's issue price. Yeah. Plus the total OID that accrued before you acquired it. Wow. I guess because that 30 to 45 days, there's a little bit of interest or something in there. Is that what they're saying? The total OID that accrued before you acquired it, before you moved into it? The market discount is the difference between the issue price plus accrued OID and your adjusted basis. <sighs> I don't get it. I can see if the house was listed at 1 million eight. And then, you know, you said, yeah, I'll, I'll buy it for 2 million. And this right here is gonna say 2 million. That was less, but you got 30 to 45 days and then that little thing is going to accrue. Not that it's going to even make it that much. It's not going to make it that much because, you know, it's not. So let me just see what this says again. That's a market discount. Don't get that, but, you know, watch the video over again and then I can understand it better. Premium. <gasps> I don't know how to fill this stuff out. Premium. A debt instrument is purchased at a premium. Okay, so this is the debt instrument and it's gonna be purchased at a premium. If it's adjusted basis immediately after purchase is greater than the total of all amounts payable on the debt instrument after the purchase date, other than, you know, prices of real estate are going up right now like crazy. So I put an offer of $2 million on that house. And that's right here. We've got 30 to 45 days. It's going to add some other interest or whatever. Yeah, this thing, this piece of paper money is going to be worth a lot. That's a premium. Other than qualified stated interest. The premium is the excess of the adjusted basis over the payable amounts. Premium will generally eliminate the future reporting of OID in income by the purchaser, as discussed under information for owners of OID debt instruments. Um, probably should look at that. Anyways, I'm getting tired. I need to eat something, but this looks good. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to read that. I have to hurry up and know this stuff like, know this like yesterday. Qualified stated interest. In general, qualified stated interest is stated interest that is unconditionally payable in cash or property other than debt instruments. Wait. Stop. other than debt instruments of the issuer. 
um, I'm not going to be doing any qualified stated interest because I'm going to be using the debt instruments at least annually over the term of the debt instrument at a single fixed rate. Stated redemption. A hey, redemption. I like that. What does it say? Stated redemption price at maturity. A debt instrument's stated redemption price at maturity is the sum of all amounts, principal and interest, payable on the debt instrument other than qualified stated interest. So right here is the qualified stated interest. Uh, that it, okay, it's in general, qualified stated interest is stated interest that is unconditionally payable in cash or property. Right, there's no conditions on it. You're going to be trading, putting cash or property. This is, though, other than debt instruments. I'm going to be doing the debt instruments. So this one's the one right here. Stated redemption price at maturity. A debt instrument's stated redemption price at maturity is the sum of all amounts, principal and interest. Well, I mean, come on. When we get it discharged or whatever the heck we're doing, it's not like it's the 30-year thing. Which, by the way, I did call and make a report about the house that I had bought in 2003, because that hasn't been 30 years yet. So that maturity, I'm gonna make a claim on that too. Okay, so yield to maturity, right. This has got to do with that other thing. Okay, good, good, good. Yeah, baby, I'm gonna get it. All right, so what's going on here? Wow. Who would have known about this stuff? You don't find this out at H&R Block. Come on. This is for the judges and the lawyers and the people who do all this kind of stuff in the banks. Hmm. Interesting. So this will be something to read. Okay. Read this one. Dead instruments issued at a discount. by states or their political subdivisions if these debt instruments are tax exempt obligations. I'm tax exempt. And I think they're tax exempt too. Remic regular interest in CDS commercial paper and bankers acceptance issued at a discount. Obligations issued at a discount by individuals. Hmm. I wonder what this means. What does it mean, people? What does it mean? It means something. This is publication 1212. Hi, information for brokers and other middlemen. All right, you can keep reading. Um... Yeah. Hey, look at that. Short term obligations redeemed at maturity. Uh, who would the middleman be? Hmm. Short-term obligations redeemed at maturity. Well, oh, I don't know. If you redeem a short-term discount obligation for the owner at maturity, you must report the discount as interest on Form 1099 INT. To figure the discount, use the purchase price shown on the owner's copy of the purchase confirmation receipt. A. Hey. Yeah, we need to see that purchase confirmation receipt. Would that be like the bill of sale or similar record or the price shown in your transaction records? If the owner's purchase price 
cannot be determined. Oops. Sorry. I can't be doing this right now. I know who you are. If the owner's purchase price cannot be determined, figure the discount as if the owner had purchased the obligation at its original issue price. Hmm. A special rule is used to determine the original issue price for information reporting on U.S. Treasury bills. Hmm. Under this rule, you treat as the original issue price of the T-bill, non-competitive weight, discount price for the longest maturity T-bill. What are you talking about? A similar rule is used to figure the discount on short-term discount obligations. There are 13-week and 26-week T-bills maturing on the same date. as the T-bill being redeemed. Oh, the T-bill is the treasury bill. And we're redeeming the treasury bill? The price actually paid by the owner cannot be established by owner or middleman records. What? You treat as the issue price of the T-bill the non-competitive discount price. I don't think my real estate person is even going to know about this stuff. They're going to be like, what the heck? And uh, going to be getting some tax attorney person maybe in there. I don't know. Well, hey, deal with it. Give me the house. Just saying. I don't know. Has anybody actually gotten a house doing any of these things? Put your comments down there. And by the way, you guys, please subscribe to my channel and like and share and comment all right i gotta get something to eat i'm hungry i'm gonna go take the steps i got my costume on do i look like a buyer i am a foreign buyer what can i say oh i got my, my hair up it's gonna be a hot day today so i'll probably be taking this off but anyways I got my costume on and I'm going to take the steps and see what up, how far I could get. We'll see. I mean, all they can say is no, or they can go, put your hands behind your back. No, excuse me. God forbid, please. Or how about, yes, we accept and get you in contract and let's do the paperwork and get her done. Yeah, I like that. That one sounds good. We want to do that one. Well, read these forms. And I'm thinking that I'm probably going to need to make some instructions. Yeah. Cover letter. 